All right. So I'm going to talk about some of the stuff I've done on understanding what brain representations are and how to test them, and specifically to um, start understanding the construct validity of them. Um, and it's going to be mostly about emotion and affective things. And this basically is my experience studying emotion. Yay! What the hell? <laughs> What is an emotion? I don't know. How is this studying the brain? Comfort me. <laughs> That's my emotion regulation. Um, so anyway, it turns out to be a really hard thing to even like talk to someone about emotion because they're like, what is an emotion? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> That's why I study it. Um, so it's hard to define, and everybody sort of disagrees about it. Um, and studying in the brain has also been really tough. So this is just a quick uh, uh, figure from Neurosynth. <clears throat> so this is 700 studies that frequently mention the word um, emotion. And these are the regions that are consistently reported. And you can see there's regions that we would think. So the amygdala, um, the insula, the cingulate. So <clears throat> would you guys say this is a brain representation of emotion? I can say, safely say that across 700 studies, this is very reliable. Eh? Eh? No. no. Why not? I There's nothing either about content or about what the contrasts are. Yeah, that's right. So this is an invariant to contrast. So you could mention emotion for a lot of ways, because this is everything but emotion, but it would still be included in here. So there's that. And also, these are just the regions that are consistently um, associated with emotion, but they're not implied. By motion. This is the idea of forward versus reverse inference that Russ Poldrack has really pushed. Um, so which regions specifically process emotion? Um, that's something that I've been working on for a while. Uh, through my PhD, um, one of the <laughs> I, I worked on stuff trying to study like social emotions, and this is basically exactly what I found, the insulin, the cingulate. Turns out this is what everybody finds, because 40% of all neuroimaging studies show this. So of those 12,000 studies, 40% of them show this exact finding, and most of them aren't about emotion. So that's crushing. Um, <laughs> so maybe you're like, OK, well, that's because there's some heterogeneity in like, maybe you'll say the insula, because that's the region I was specifically interested in. Maybe there's different parts of the insula that matter. Um, and if you, study, if you look at the, the literature on the insula, everybody, it's found in pretty much all domains of cognitive neuroscience. Um, so one of the things I did for a, a summer project was doing a, a functional parcellation and resting state, and then we also did it um, using neurosynth, using coactivation, and we find this really nice um, uh, uh, tripartite di uh, division of the insula um, with this kind of ventral part maybe being more with emotion, this back part with more vestibular sensory, and the, and the dorsal interior more with cognitive. Um, and that was really exciting. I was like, this is cool. I finally am like, moving beyond like SPM and FSL. I can start doing my own types of analyses and questions. Um, and then someone published the exact same paper. Uh, and I was like, god damn. I was actually kind of crushed. It was my first experience of getting scooped really badly. So here's a pro tip about being scooped. I just discovered this last week when I was pulling up slides for another talk. Um, so this is the paper that scooped me. It's a really good paper. found the exact same thing we found, almost the exact same methods. Uh, somehow, even though it came out a year before, we've now eclipsed its, its <laughs> citations. And it's not because I'm promoting it. I've actually, I've rarely ever talked about this study. And I never, I hardly cite it as well. Um, so somehow, something about it is, is useful and it's getting picked up. And there's room for many people to be working on the same project. And it can come out at different times. And it's still worth pursuing. And we shouldn't get so upset about it. Um, so why did this happen? So one is, when I, when I calm down and regulate my emotions with my like, animal, <laughs> uh, I was like, something that should have been glaringly obvious, which is, OK, that's cool you found these subdivisions, but what do they mean? What are they, what's the function of them? And I had never considered it myself, and they certainly didn't consider it in their paper either. And so I was complaining about this to my friend Talia Arconi, and he was like, oh, well, that sucks. But let me tell you something. What I've been doing, which is like creating neurosynth, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. You know, I bet we can use that to decode any type of map. Um, and so that's what we did. And we, uh, if you look at the coactivation of these different regions, if you look at them, and just because we know a lot about the brain and cognitive neuroscience and read a lot of papers, we can kind of figure out what these are. But if we let a computer try to tell us what, um, what these maps are doing, it also does a really good job, and it's really consistent. So how it does this is it reads the literature, and it's like a bag of words. So it's just like the probability of the word being associated with these different things. And you can see that the computer also thinks this is emotion, this is something about cognitive control, and this one's more about um, somatosensory processing. Um, there was another interesting finding, a paper I really liked by Nico Dosenbach on that the insula is involved in goal-directed um, attention. 
And you can see here, so this is a bunch of different functions. And the dorsal anterior insula is kind of activated or consistent with all of those, which is consistent with their hypothesis. But if you look at what's implied by the region, so if you do the reverse inference, you start seeing much more functional subdivisions, where one part is specifically with the attention, um, you know, cognitive control. One's more sensory motor, and one's more um, chemosensory or uh, effective. Um, we've taken this idea of like decoding and using other in information or probabilities um, about when you find things in the literature to decode other things. So one of them, this actually started at a hackathon I mentioned on the first day. Uh, this is we took data from the Allen Brain um, Atlas, and there was six at the time. I think it's they've kind of given up on this part, but they've they've been adding um, data from in other ways. Um, but there were six human um, postmortem brains, and they had 58,000 gene probes. And they basically took, across all six brains, 3,700 different tissue samples and did this full 58,000 gene probe. And we were basically, there's a bunch of genes um, that people knew about, and there's a bunch that no one's, they're not even named, no one knows what they do. And the question was, can we use anything we know about how the brain's organized uh, to make an inference or a prediction about what genes might be associated with certain cognitive functions? So all of you should be thinking, there's no way this is going to work. Because that's the truth. It shouldn't work. This is insane when you think about it. Um, so how do we convince ourselves? And the, I'll just tell you as an aside, we didn't, but we convinced ourselves enough it was worth telling people about, but I, I still don't fully believe it. But here's the concept. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> there's each gene, if you look at the gene expression across space, we can do some things like dilate them and, and make some assumptions that things that are closer in space are probably more similar. And then we can look at the spatial similarity to neurosynth topics and try to find regions that might <clears throat> correspond. So like memory, what genes correspond most with our memory, idea of how we think memory is um, um, stored in the brain, or emotion or reward. Um, so we find things. So this is the most, the strongest rep, um, correlation. It's with claspin, which nobody knows what it does. Um, but it maybe has something to do with memory. This is like a hypothesis generation. But how do we know if this thing actually works? So we tried to validate it. So we scraped um, like 40,000 gene abstracts and did um, figured out which associations are in the literature that people know about psychology and genes. So there's like <clears throat> neurotransmitters, and we basically tested to see how many of these hypotheses we could recover using our, our method. And it's like 80% of them, which is pretty cool. So like dopamine and reward, and um, serotonin and emotion, and, th and things like that. So this is um, dopamine. Uh, I think this is just the broad, if you average <clears throat> across all the different dopamine receptors, and then correlate with the reward tap topic, and there's a, you know, a, some sort of association. Um, so this is just a quick um, plot showing the specificity of a few different um, neurotransmitters. Uh, and then this is the distribution of what um, the spatial correlation across all 58,000 gene probes. Actually, I think we narrowed it down to about 20,000. We did some averaging. And you can see these are the top ones. So there's some interesting ones. So in emotion, for example, there's this one called PTGER3. Um, and I think it's like pro pro prostaglandin. And it's, it's somehow involved in the production of adrenocorticotropin um, more stuff. I don't know exactly how or why, uh, but it's been implicated in that. And so this is a novel hypothesis that no one had really ever tested before. And the, basically, we sent this to a bunch of places, and, and they were like, this is pretty amazing if it's true, but I don't believe it because you didn't find my pet gene that didn't replicate anyway by other people. Or this is really cool, and I don't believe it because your data is not that great. That's fine. Um, and so the review or the editors were like, look, if you can find some way to show that this is plausible, we'll probably take it. Um, so the first thing we did was like, okay, well, let's, let's do a, like a GWAS. It turns out you need more than like 50 people, which is what our budget was. So we found some data sets online. One was 70,000 person one that has neuroticism, which is like a phenotype um, for negative affect, for trait level negative affect. And it turns out that a lot of these genes, including PTGER3, are overrepresented in the gene expression for that. Um, and the editors were like, okay, that's cool, great. Um, can you do it again? And we're like, look, nobody wants, we're like, nobody is in the gene world. No one wants to share their data with us. And also, there's actually, turns out, very few psychological phenotypes um, that map onto things that we could do with, with neurosynth. Um, so then we went to monkeys, and we got some data from, I think it's 40 different monkeys that have behavioral um, uh, traits of anxiety expression, and we looked at tissue samples in the amygdala, and we also find some of these same things expressed um, in anxious uh, monkeys, so including PTGER3 and others. So, still don't believe it, but I think it's enough where I'm going to tell you about it, and hopefully we'll get it published. It's been in a review for about four years now, so. Um, we've been, since then, there's been three papers that come out in Science on it, and in PNAS, and so. <laughs> 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 
Uh, also, I think so. I think that's something that's a really cool application that you know we should be skeptical about, but you know, int you know, optimistic and, and probing where it's going to go. But also, decoding can be misused, and this is one of my favorite examples where they took exactly what we did in our nursing thing to argue that the dorsal and sing cingulate is selective for pain. In case you guys didn't know that, it's actually not true. <laughs> Um, and so there's a whole bunch of blog posts. We'll, um, I have some links in our, our lab later. We wrote a rebuttal on it, and then there's a, like Talia Coney and Tor and Alex Shackman. Um, I started writing my own blog post too, but then I realized I can't finish anything, so it's like half written. Um, but anyway, everybody was kind of outraged by this, so we just got a bunch of people who were kind of pissed off, and we wrote a co collective comment. Um, <clears throat> so I, when I was graduate um, from graduate school and I was kind of crushed by imaging about can we really make any inferences about anything, I was thinking I would just go pure like computational modeling. And when I was shopping around for postdocs, one, um, one thing that just blew my mind, and it hadn't come out yet, was when I visited Tor Wager's lab and he'd had his um, neural pain signature uh, that I guess had also been under review for several years. <clears throat> and, it, and when he was showing me, I was like, there's no way this could be the case, that it could work this well. But I was like really intrigued. Um, so I went to Boulder to work with them on this and develop some of the methods and extend them and also think about what, what this means and how could it work and where can we go with it. Um, so we recently have an, an, an opinion article about what our perspective is on these predictive models and it's specifically geared towards translational applications. Um, but what I think is really nice about this is that you, there's no way that these models are the correct model, but I think they could still be useful for helping us understand how certain constructs are represented in the brain. And so the idea is that you have to have specify a precise model, and in cognitive neuroscience, of course, that's something that we've been really bad, in psychology in general, we've been really bad at. Um, so there's exact weights, and I can give this weights to another lab, and they can test it to see if it works or not. Like, that's the strictest test of hypothesis that we could have. Um, and then we can revise them and change it over time as we get new information, but that's really key. It's not just like, well, it's sort of around the singulate, so I'm going to say it's the exact same thing like uh, Matt and Naomi did in their like, really seminal paper on, which I also think is wrong, but that pain and, um, and social rejection are the same thing. I think that kind of fuzziness is, can lead us astray in how we're interpreting what's going on in the brain. So the key thing, and this is what really, a lot of people are doing decoding stuff, but what really drew me to what Tor was doing was that he was really focused on understanding the sensitivity and specificity, and not just at the group level, but at an individual person level. And so if we really want to take imaging seriously and think that we can ever do anything useful clinically or diagnostically with it, it doesn't matter if you know, your 30 subjects in the scanner show this on average in this minuscule effect size. It matters if we can do it in one person and that we can see it with just a little bit of data that we have. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm going to tell you about, the, the trajectory of how you can do this and tools we built to help. And the key thing is to, um, to strive towards generalizable representations. So uh, when I was my postdoc, we, I, we worked on a whole bunch of different effective states. So the key thing, this worked for pain, um, but does it work for other things? I was like so convinced that it was like a scam. I, I tested on about 25 different data sets his pain signature, and it worked so well, we started putting it in a quality control thing to make sure that the timing was right on like a shock paradigm. Like it's that reliable, it's amazing. Um, so this is one I'm gonna talk about today, and then we're gonna work through actually how to replicate it and run it um, in the lab this afternoon. Uh, this was one, if we have time, I'll go into this, but I doubt we will, um, on if experiencing pain is the same as observing pain in others. Um, and then another one was, this is a time series where we're trying to predict um, autonomic indicators like heart rate and skin conductance. Um, and all of the patterns that we use to develop these are available on, our, on um, the TORS Labs GitHub page now. Okay, <clears throat> so this was um, a project that was done in collaboration with Pete Gennaros and Steve Manick at Pittsburgh. They have this large um, longitudinal study uh, investigating um, cardiovascular risk, and it's in the greater Pittsburgh area. They have like thousands of subjects now on a bunch of paradigms. And one of their paradigms was um, the classic IAPS, like emotion regulation task that was developed by Kevin Oxner and James Gross and others. So the task is really simple. You, you're, in, you're told to either look or reappraise. Um, we're just lo looking at the look tri tri um, trials right now. And you see an image, and then afterwards you rate what your image is. And what we're trying to do here is decode what, what can we find about the brain that can predict what your rating is going to be, and is this consistent across people. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, this way, I've tried it a bunch of ways, and this one seems to be pretty fast and easy and work reasonably well, but there's a lot of room for improvement. So the first is we do, this is a standard unit vary approach. We do a temporal data reduction. Um, <clears throat> so we make a, a, a regressor for each of the intensities of the ratings, and so we're averaging over all the times they said it was a one, so this is across different images. And then we get um, a beta estimate for every voxel in the brain. 
and for every subject. And then we can stack all the subjects together and unravel um, the brain um, into a vector. And then that becomes the X or the design, what, what we're trying to predict, our, our regressors, to predict the outcome, which is the rating. And then this gives us um, a map that we can use to multiply by any other new data to give a prediction for what the, the predicted effective rating would be. So this one we're calling the picture-induced negative emotion signature because we really didn't want to commit that this was actually emotion. I think I'm, I'm pretty convinced this doesn't generalize outside of pictures and also that it probably doesn't even, the negative part probably is also wrong as we're coming to find out as we're testing this on different data sets. Um, it's a whole brain map. I'm just thresholding it because the reviewers made us um, and because they felt it give them a more intuitive way to understand a 300,000 dimensional space. Um, does it help? Ah, I don't know. But at least there's like some candidate regions like the amygdala, the insula, um, parts of the MPFC, PCC, visual cortex, things you'd expect that p other people have found, which is good. But importantly, it's a pattern and, and it has weights through the entire brain. So the key thing I think about patterns, it's super, as you're going to see, it's embarrassingly easy. Yeah. So, well, the, so the pattern is, uh, it's just a regression. And it, the type of regression turns out not to matter, if you're, at least in this, when you have enough data and it, using linear methods. So I've specifically used uh, principal components regression that's penalized with a lasso. But if you do it with like a support vector regression or a ridge regression, you get almost the exact same weights. So it's like, um, like, so it's like multivariate pattern, uh, uh, pattern uh, it, Yeah, it's like, you know, if you think about like classification, rather than two states, we're just predicting the, con the continuous over, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that, those weights give you almost the exact same thing right. as well. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you want to try? Oh, so, uh, the quick question about the data, like by stacking together the individual subjects, how do you do the random regression? Right. So, this is something that I have an intuition about, and I'm not sure I'm right. And Eshin and I argue about this a lot. Um, and he might be right still, so I'm going to give him that out. Uh, so, one question so the reason why we do random effects in general is because, as opposed to fixed effects, is because we want to generalize whatever our parameter estimate we, we find, we want to make sure that that's going to generalize to this, the population as opposed to that specific sample. But um, that's fine when, so when you're doing um, this prediction stuff, on the one hand, we can estimate parameters and do hypothesis tests on it. That's what we normally do in imaging, univariate imaging. But we can also do prediction where we don't care exactly about what the parameters are. Um, we just want to know how well it works out of sample. And those are kind of two different traditions using regression that don't always like, work well together. But in my opinion, and this is just an opinion, I don't know the truth or not, if you do a cross-validation where you're holding out sample subjects and you're predicting a new subject, you're effectively getting parameter estimates that are like a random effects. Well, so, so you could be hurting your prediction, but it's really on the generalizability of your prediction to new data. Um, so maybe you could do better if you modeled it. That's, that's certainly possible. I, just like in normal random effects regression, um, if you have enough subjects, it doesn't actually matter. It, it, it's basically exactly, it, it, they, they asymptotes to the fixed effect solution. Um, it only you get the benefit when you have small da data sets. And that's what I'm going to argue here. And I'll show you one plot that leads me to believe that that's probably true. But if you have this one, we happen to have not a lot of tr data per subject, but we had 180 subjects. And I think as you have more data, you start, um, you start getting shrinkage towards what the mean would be. Yeah, but it's a, it's a, good, it's a good point. And I think this is an open question. Like, p this hasn't, that, the random effects hasn't really been done. I haven't seen it in a great use of it yet in, in prediction stuff. Other questions about that? If you have lingering questions, we'll still talk. We can have time to talk in the lab, too. OK, uh, so the next thing is, oh, yeah, so how do we validate it? So we did cross-validation, but it also we did a separate holdout sample where we took one third of our data and just left it out for when we were going to publish it. So we only tested the model once on it. And the idea is that even if you use cross-validation, it's still easy to introduce experiment or bias in, where we're optimizing until I find the one thing I want. And what's nice, you can see that there's very minimal bias. So our cross-validation in the 120 subjects versus the 60, it's almost the same. So we're doing about just as well. And depending on how you look at it, so if you say something that should be really easy, like what's the most um, um, effective negative pictures versus the least, um, and all 180 subjects were at 100% accuracy distinguishing between that. And that sounds like really impressive, like it's too good to be true. But on the other hand, if you can't do that, like why are we even doing brain imaging? I mean, this is, this is such an easy problem that I'm not surprised that it should be that hard. As you get to be harder and harder problems, the accuracy is going to go down. Um, 
So the, all of these um, other figures, they're only done on the holdout sample. So there's no way that there was any bias in the fitting versus the testing. But we can take the model and apply it to, in different ways. So this one, we applied it to the whole entire time series. And then we basically made these peristimulus plots by finding, lining up where the trial happened and then just conditioning on the, the different ratings that they had. And you can see a monotonic increase on the ratings. But also, it, it, there's, even though we didn't specify this necessarily in the training, um, there's an HRF shape that it's recovering too, which is pretty cool. And then also we can look at a single item, which is amazing for fMRI. And so these are averages across people. Um, and these are the neutral images, and these are the negative. And even within the negative, you're starting to see some um, um, differentiation, I think, which is also really neat. So the question, that, of course, that everybody who's in this room mostly wants to know, as opposed to like computer science people, that's amazing you can do this prediction. But what did you learn about the brain? Um, and I don't, I don't actually have an answer. This is sort of a little hand wavy. No, I'm just kidding. I, so I think one is like, how is information represented in the brain? Um, so if you ask people where's emotion, they're like amygdala. Well, how much variance of the outcome can we actually explain by the amygdala activation? Um, it's reliable. So about 10% of the variance, that's great. Uh, what about other emotion regions like the cingulate or the insula? They also do about the same. What if we look at the single best region of the brain? Um, so we just do a searchlight for this around. And it, it explains a little bit better about 20% of the variance. And what about the whole brain model? How well does that do? Um, it's almost an order of magnitude more than the amygdala alone. And it's, it's about 85% of the variance we can explain with the whole model. So what I take this to mean is that um, emotion, even though the amygdala is probably involved in, in something about the experience of emotion, it's not, the full, it's not capturing the full construct. We need more regions to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a good question, and it's not exactly easy to do. So how we've tried to do it is, um, and, and we, we, we kind of outlined how to do it in this paper, uh, you can, because these are subsets of the model, we can do like a nested model comparison and see like how much does the variance drop, um, for example. So uh, let's see, did I put a slide in for this? I might have taken, oh, here's a slide. So for example, um, we can do some clustering um, to find which regions seem to cluster together. We can also do resting state networks um, parcellations to see. And we can do things like which regions are necessary and sufficient. So if you take this region out, how much does your prediction drop? Um, and it turns out none of these regions are necessary or sufficient. So you can remove any of them, and your prediction is almost just as good. And of course, you can go, OK, well, what combination of them? And that, that we haven't really worked out those details. But I think that's a pretty cool way to go. Um, and also interactions between them. We haven't looked at any of that type of stuff yet. Yeah, Harrison. Um, so those specific ones that I just showed you, those are from if you just take the average. Let's see, is it the average? I think it's if you take an masked ROI of the model. So it's a subset of that. So it's just the independent variance of those controlling for all the other regions. They, they could actually. So I think if I'm what I said is true, which I'm not sure, but assuming that's true, then it's the insula controlling for the amygdala and the amygdala controlling for the insula. Um, but I've done it a bunch of ways. It's there's like million analyses in paper. I can't remember specifically which one that number came from. Um, OK, here's where I get to tell you my opinion, and that's to skip the searchlight. Uh, this might sound like heresy to many of you, and it probably is. I'm sure half the people in the room will prove me wrong by the end of the day. But here's, here's my reasoning for this. So one, searchlight is like the gold standard. This is what Kriegscourt proposed as a way to do it for his information mapping. And the idea was like this will show you where in the brain um, we can capture variants. But there's some, I think, logical problems with it. And then practical. So practically, it's super computationally expensive. So my model I can run once, and it takes seven seconds on my laptop that we're going to do later this afternoon. If I wanted to do a searchlight, and I did it per voxel of all uh, 328,000 voxels in there, that's 320,000 seven seconds, right? What do I gain from that? Well, I'm not, I think we actually lose things by doing that personally. But I do think there's a time for searchlights. I just don't think in this approach. I think it's not a great way to go. Uh, another problem is, well, you, if you do that way, you have to correct for multiple comparisons. Um, that sucks. <laughs> now you're in the same problem as the univariate that you're trying to get away from. Um, there's some other region, uh, examples, too, which I'm not going to do technically, which is that um, a lot of ways people do searchlight analyses, they don't make an assumption across subjects that the weights have to go the same direction. It could just be that for this person, it decodes. For this person, it decodes. And if you look at the average accuracy, that's significant. But the weights can go completely different. So you can actually have signs where the middle goes up for some people and down for people. But that could still be significant from a typical standard 
information mapping approach, which some people might think is a really good thing because that allows everyone to be different. But if you're trying to understand what's similar across people for the brain, I think that's actually a terrible way to go. Um, another problem with the searchlight is it only controls for activating them in the local regions within the searchlight, whereas the whole brain, or you know, if you take larger swaths of tissue, they're controlling for the activation of across all the other regions in the in the searchlight or in the in the ROI. Another thing is even if people are like, okay, well, but the searchlight at least tell us where, right? And I actually think that's a, a miss. I think that's also a logical fallacy because you can't actually compare regions using a searchlight probe about which one's better. You could only do that by controlling for the other one to find that. So actually, you want to do a whole brain if that's what you're interested in, or other types of approaches. Another huge problem, and I think a lot of people haven't realized this yet because they actually never save what their weights are for the searchlights, is you can't integrate them because all the searchlights are overlapping, and there's no way to arbitrate between which variants are you going to do. You'd have to train a meta model of all the other searchlights. Um, and that seems silly. Um, and yeah, like I said, most people don't even save the model weights. So what I advocate for is either using whole brain, at least starting with that, because it's really easy, or if you care about certain regions, use parcellation schemes, and you can just crank up the de degree of granularity you want. And there's a whole bunch of uh, really nice parcellations, or you can just pick specific ROIs. Okay, hackathon idea. So there's a bunch of people already like excited about this stuff and working on it. So um, Yoni's been working on using the same idea, but doing, well, I, I don't know. As of yesterday, before I went home to work on this talk, this is what was happening. Uh, pairwise connectivity. So we, this was only looking at the mean activation of voxel, but maybe you could imagine that the correlations between them, and we could train a model to predict that. Um, uh, Aaron was working on, if you look at, instead of like at the normal, typical HRF, maybe like the duration or how long the, the emotion response is sustained might give you some other in, independent information. I think that's a really cool idea. And then another one is an idea I've been really excited about um, and haven't had time to do, but Fei Long and Vincent and Steve expressed interest in this yesterday about trying to look at the spatial frequency of how information is encoded in the brain. So um, a lot of stuff that, that Jim was talking about, I think it's actually a high spatial frequency, whereas um, stuff that I'm talking about with emotion, I think is at a lower spatial frequency and more distributed throughout the brain. And I think that's also why I can do such, so well on, on the accuracy without doing hyperalignment. Um, and I have another, a bunch of other reasons why that's the case, but why well, I think that's the case, but it's an open question. Here's just because, like, this is a, where I'm talking about decoding. I'm just going to tell you other random things that surprised me. This one, a reviewer made me run this analysis, and I was really surprised by the results. So um, what if you did, maybe if we did the, 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 the same subject, um, if you only trained a model per subject, maybe that model would do better for predicting their own data. And that's, I think, what most people's intuition would be. Um, but no one had really previously done a, a study like this where you have more between subjects than you have within subject data. Um, it's usually the opposite. Like in a Gallant lab, they'll scan themselves, like the authors of the paper, for like hours, and they'll have tons and tons and tons of data, but only like five subjects or three subjects. Um, so this is basically plotting um, on at a trial level on through a, a cross validation how well the pines can predict their data versus a model trained on their own data. And of I think this is 120 subjects, um, uh, there's only a few where their own data works better than the group. Yeah, so I don't know if power matters. It's more about like the it's your 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 yeah. You, you, it's that you have a better estimate of what's going on, and, and you basically can account for noise better. It, it, I think these are being overfit. That's what's happening. Okay, so can I ask again? So if you have certain subjects, each of them have three thousand data points. Mm -hmm. If, if you had seven subjects with 2,000, I think it would go the other way. Yeah. But if you had 7,000 subjects with 7,000 data points, I'm not sure. I think it might, I'm, I have no idea. Right. It, might, so it might go the other way. People, we don't know. Yeah. It could be that the ratio of subjects within subject trials is what's determining. Yeah, the exactly. And what gives me it's that. Useful, depending on the kind of data one has, yeah. this might work better. I mean, it would be useful as a metric for you. In itself, yeah. It was just like, how do I justify like one doing another study with IAPS? Because it, it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, like, I need 7,000 subjects with 7,000 trials. Like, like, someone give me, like, you know, $10 million for this. <laughs> One methods question. Um, this uh, is another figure that a reviewer made me run, which I wanted to punch them in the face uh, because it took a month on my cluster to run. But now I'm really happy I have the figure, so I thank you if they're in the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can see my volatility already <laughs> from the beginning of the lecture. So this is um, the reviewer. It was a misunderstanding, in my opinion, of statistics on their part. And they're like, well, you had too much data, so you're totally overfitting. It, it's, it's actually not possible. That's, it, it, they're two conflating ideas. 
But anyway, the question is, what happens if you use less data? How well can you do? And what's amazing is like with like 10 subjects, you're already um, doing quite well. And as you get to about 20 set subjects, 30, you're already starting to ask Matoda, is the best that we're going to be able to get? And for the specificity, so if you try to do this on pain, um, it's a little noisier with not many subjects. And as you get more, you get better and better and more specific. Um, and the thing that's really interesting, I think this, this is going to what Ida and, um, and Yuan Chang were talking about, is as you have more subjects, um, how similar you get to our final thing, um, it, gets, it almost like it linearly increases. Um, and what that means is I think the weights are changing. They're very unreliable. And as you get more and more and more and more subjects, um, the weights start becoming more reliable, and you're counting for this error across. And it, you're getting what's called, called statistical shrinkage towards the group. And I think that's why this is doing so well, that we saw that between versus within effect. But again, this is just like a hypothesis. We haven't really fully fleshed that out. That's true. OK, so the last part for just like a few minutes, I want to talk about what construct validation is. So I know there's a few other clinical people here, um, Yoni and Vincent and, um, and Nate. So when I was a first year clinical student, this stuff gets beat into your head about what construct validation is, because what you spend your life doing if you go on the assessment route is just running tests that were basically developed 150 years ago. Um, and you're not allowed to change how it's done, because then it invalidates it, because it's not the same conditions or the same method. And it's horrible. So I stopped doing that, personally. But I took this, this idea, which is um, from Kronbach and Meal. And they were actually tasked by the APA to come up with um, a way, this is basically when clinical psychology was starting to flourish and there's all these measures, how do we come up with a set of guidelines to evaluate different measures? And so this paper is basically what they argued. And so they defined a construct as um, a network of associations or propositions in which it occurs. Constructs employed at different stages of research vary in definiteness. Um, so you can imagine we have a model and we test on a data set and we want to test on another data set. Um, or we could compare it to another model and see how similar they are. So that would be like the normal validity. Um, and then that one might have been validated on other data sets. So the idea of a construct validation isn't that you do it in one study, it's what you do out afterwards as you start to test it on other data sets. Um, one thing that was also horrible as a clinical student to learn was called the multi-trait, multi-method matrix by Campbell and Fisk. And what they argued is that validation requires convergence using independent measurement procedures. So it could just be that every time you do the IAPS, it works, but if you do another emotion thing, it doesn't work at all, so it's very method dependent. Um, it also must discriminate non-related constructs. So we could get this totally working because you just were looking at pictures. So if you looked at any picture, maybe it goes up. And that wouldn't be interesting for emotion. Um, and there's error in the construct and its measurement. And so basically they argued for this multi-trait, multi-method matrix, which is that more than one trait as well as more than one method must be employed in the validation process. And they came up, you know, there's like a correlation matrix and there's ways to evaluate the construct validity, different parts of it through there. Um, so other people, we've shared our model. It's now on NeuroVault, so anyone can download it. Um, we've shared it with other groups. This is from uh, Michael Gilead and Kevin Ochner, and they tested it on their scanner at Columbia on a different test using effective um, images. And you see a really nice replication of the negative versus neutral. And they also did some sort of psychological, I don't know, reappraisal or something. I, I didn't actually read their paper. But it was, um, I think it's psychological distancing. Um, and they basically find that it decreased. I didn't read it because it wasn't interested, because they told me. and I. <laughs> Sorry, that's not really bad. <laughs> and I'm going to have to edit that out of the thing. <laughs> and I was also crushed because they scooped me on my own paper with my own uh, data, so that was also crushing. Um, lesson be learned, but I still stand strong for open science. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, man. <laughs> Uh, so we can also test, test the specificity of this. So in our original Pines paper, we tested it on pain data. So if, pine, if, if, um, if what we're capturing is something about arousal or salience, whatever that means, um, then it should also get confused when you test it on pain. Um, and so we also have another model called the neural pain signature. And if we test both of those on, on the emotion data, the emotion one works and the pain one doesn't. And if we test on pain data, the pain one works and the emotion one doesn't. So this is at least suggestive, at least with respect to pain, this seems to be an independent construct. Um, so I helped with a lot of this and a lot of other people in Tor's lab. He has this massive machine where everyone's feeding him data from all around the world. And they're basically trying to figure out what these receptive fields are with respect to the construct of pain. And basically we find that there's a whole bunch of things that it doesn't get confused by. And there's a whole bunch of things that it, it does get confused by. And it's basically things of pain and things of not pain. So I think this is really cool where we can use the brain as a way to assess psychological constructs. And basically, everyone's annoying. Like, we have all this data coming in. Um, where are we going to have results? What are we going to do? When are we going to write this paper? And you can imagine when there's like a queue of like 50 data sets that are just piling in, that that's a really inefficient way to do it. 
Um, so we developed, Tor and I developed this website called Neuralearn, um, which is a way where you can just take us out of the picture. Um, you can put all of your data on Neuroval, and then this, this application plugs into Neuroval, and you can search it and train your own models and then test it on any other data. And so the idea is as more people start buying in and contributing their data to train their own things and test it, it their data serves as a test data for other people. Um, so this is online. It works. I'm, if you guys want to start beta testing, that'd be amazing. Um, these are some models that I, I, I've been training, training when I've been testing it. Um, you can select data. So this is actually the real data we used in the Pines paper you can take. This is what we're going to do this afternoon. Um, you select the training labels if they're available. Otherwise, you can manually annotate it yourself. Uh, you pick like which algorithm you want, what type of cross-validation, if you want to share it or not. If you want to do any feature selection, like a mask. Um, and then you get some results, which is the, the weight map, and people can download it. Um, you can see how well it works in cross-validation if you were running that. And then now you can start testing it on other data sets in there. And I'm still, we're still kind of, I'm not thrilled with the interface yet for the testing, but uh, this is testing, I don't remember if this is a pain model or a motion model, on a bunch of different data sets that are in NeuroVault at one point. Um, and so you can start getting the sense, like the construct validity of, of, of things. Um, anything in NeuroVault, it's basically anything that people share on there. So there's... I don't know, 4,000, 3 or 4,000 different um, images on there, um, or data sets, I think, different things. Uh, I just picked a few of these that were painted in motion. Uh, I think I'm going to stop there. I have another section. There is another, I think, a really nice example where the brain can actually do better than psychology and philosophy at getting an idea. But, yeah. Anyone questions? Maybe I'll just zoom ahead to the... Um, so, yeah, I guess think Tor's lab and our lab, and um, Anton um, Bernishev is one of the developers I have that's helped a lot with this. And then um, we've gotten some funding at Dartmouth to help pay for the development of the website, which has been really nice. Um, yeah, so thank you guys. You guys want to sacrifice your ability to ask me a question today because you can ask me in like 10 minutes <laughs> or like the rest of the week. So it turns out I'll be here all week. <laughs> My wife was still asking me, she's like, when are you coming home? Do you have to be there for everything? <laughs> um, okay, so I'll go with this pretty quick. Uh, basically, in like philosophy and psychology, science, there's been um, a big debate about simulation theory and theory theory. And here's just like two quotes of, I think, examples that, that summarize this. So from um, Ramachandran, uh, the discovery of mirror neurons in the frontal lobes of monkeys and their potential relevance to, to human brain evolution is the single most important unreported story of the decade. I predict that mirror neurons will do for psychology what DNA did for biology. They'll provide a unifying framework and help explain a host of mental abilities that have hitherto remained mysterious and inaccessible to experiments. We, yeah. In retrospect, that seems foolish, uh, but it was really exciting at the time when these things were discovered in, 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 in primates. Um, theory theory, this is one from Adam Smith, so we can go even further back. Um, this is actually the quote we used for um, this paper. Um, Though our brothers upon the rack, so this is from a theory of moral sentiments, in case you guys haven't read it, it's amazing. Uh, Though our brothers upon the rack, as long as we ourselves are at ease, our senses will never inform us of what he suffers. It's by the imagination only that we can form any conception of what his sensations are. And so the idea is that we actually don't experience what they're experiencing. We have an idea of what they're doing, and we're, we're mentally projecting. And so in psychology in the 90s and early 2000s, this was called the, the empathy gap. So you could be for the future, it could be for the past, it could be for somebody else. So this one was done, it was led by um, Anjali Krishnan, and then um, Tor and Wani and I basically did all the analyses and kind of did the paper. And then we have a bunch of authors because they contributed other data sets that we tested it on. So um, this is from the Dessetti and, and, and Jackson um, thing. So people get thermal pain either on their arm or their foot, and then they look at pictures of harm to um, harm or foot, and they rate how they're feeling. And we want to know, there's been a, a, a bunch of studies that have been controversial if they've shown that it's the same thing or not. So this is ratings. So we see they're more or less matched. They were designed to be matched um, on their behavioral ratings. And that there's not really a, a difference in perception of upper and lower, like the arm or the foot, essentially. So the first thing we did is we trained a model. Um, we already had a model of pain that Tora developed. And then um, we trained a model of vicarious pain. So what's a whole brain map that can predict um, how somebody else, how, how you feel in response to somebody else's pain? And you can see that already, these are thresholded. It, the, again, both maps are whole, well, this map's whole brain. This one's partial, 
part of the brain. Um, but they look really different. So while this one has like somatosensory representations and, and cingulate and parts of the dorsal posterior insula, this one's more like in the amygdala and the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and they both do really well. And what's nice is this idea that we can do this thing, um, testing this idea of separate modifiability. So that's basically like, is one unaffected as we increase um, the other? And so we can test this on two different data sets to see how it goes. So when we test the pain one, we nicely replicate and extend and show that the pain thing is working on different scanners in different types of areas of pain, which is great. That didn't have to be the case. It might have only worked on upper limb because that's what it was trained on and not lower limb. Um, but it's unresponsive to the vicarious pain stuff. And we, our vicarious pain signature works really well at predicting intensities of vicarious pain, but it's unresponsive to the somatic pain. So this is basically, I think, um, nice evidence of what's like a double association or separate modifiability. Um, another really interesting thing is, okay, well, let's, be, let's give it a really fair test of this, um, this simulation theory. Um, so let's basically see if we can decode the location of the hand and foot just from sensory motor um, cortex. And essentially, we're at chance. It can't do it um, in the in sensory cortex for the vicarious pain. Um, but we can do it really well for somatic pain, and it has a nice like um, homunculus mapping of how we know the sensory cortex is organized. Interestingly, in the DMPFC, we can actually discriminate in vicarious pain if it's hand or foot. So this is also consistent with the idea of this mental projection. Um, other people might say, well, it, you guys just use this different task. It's different. You know, Tanya Singer was right. After all, you guys just screwed it up. Um, and so if we do it the univariate approach, we actually replicate all of the previous findings, which is that the cingulate and ACC overlap if you look at the conjunction between these. Um, but we argue that this is problematic because there's a whole bunch of regions, ways why this might happen, including it's just, it's more engaging or salient or attention, um, right? And that's, we already know that these are the most frequently observed regions of, of the brain, 40%, that's what I started with. Um, it's not surprising if that also, if you do two different tasks, they're also engaged in that. It doesn't imply that it's the same representation or not. Um, this is basically the same, same searchlight thing I found before, but in a different data set, so I'm just gonna skip that. So this is, I think, what's really cool about this paper is how well um, does this generalize to other labs and paradigms? So this is from Spain. Um, this is um, pressure pain. So it's pushing down on a nail bed. So it's not thermal pain at all. Um, the pain signature generalizes. Uh, this is to shock pain. This is from Jin Fan's group. It also generalizes to shocks instead um, compared to no shocks. Um, and, and it doesn't respond to observed pain. But our vic vicarious pain um, generalizes to whatever pictures they use for their vicarious thing. Um, we have another paper that's, that's, I think, under review right now um, that's more like the classic Tanya Singer one where you're watching someone get pain. It's not a picture of it happening. And it also, um, it's basically the exact paradigm she used, and it works on that. We actually, um, we had 14 rejections on this paper for anyone who wants to know a lesson in persistence under three years under review. Three revi two revisions, so we had three rounds in Nature Neuroscience, three rounds at PNAS. Um, we got reviewed at Science, and one person accepted it, the other person rejected it because they didn't want to get scooped. I found out, I knew someone had an inside scoop there. Um, so you can imagine if people's careers are at stake, if you're pushing people's buttons, that it's difficult to get published. So it's all about persistence. Um, I think that's all I want to say about that. Oh, so basically about, we got rejected at PNAS, they were like, oh, well, you know what? Um, so first the revision was like, okay, well, we don't believe you, you should have done this other task, you should now rerun another study. And then maybe I'll consider it my study, essentially, is what that person was saying. Um, so we're like, OK, we, we've actually already done that. Here's the data. It works just as well. We're happy to include it if you want. Um, but the paper already has like you know, 15 studies in it. Like I don't think adding one more is going to be more convincing. Um, and the person's like, no, because the authors were not compliant and didn't want to do it, I'm rejecting their paper, even though it clearly went against their thing. So anyway, people are really annoying. I'm not sure I'm an advocate of peer review. but. Uh, the paper is way worse than when we started. The first version was amazing. It was a really nice, <laughs> well-read paper. Now it's really dense, and we've answered so many, so many reviewers' uh, feedback through the thing that it's kind of like this jumbled mess. Um, does that get you guys pumped up to do some <laughs> science? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> What's that? Uh, that's. It's, it's good because it's my own pain, but it's also vicarious for the author. So one of them was on the job market, and this was her main paper. Um, and yeah, yeah. The other, the other real pain was when the paper of the person who rejected us at science, when their paper finally came out, our paper, coincidentally, started getting accepted. Um, yes, I had. Can I ask a scientific yeah. sort of different method kind of? Yes, yeah, yeah, for sure. 
it is one thing to focus on a particular case, which is like pain. It is another thing to think about maybe uh, cognitive building blocks in the brain mm -hmm. that could be used in multiple different kinds of functions yep. in kind of Lego-like ways. So there would be some parts of the brain that might have been just because of the training and because mm -hmm. of their proximity to other regions or their structural connectivity or size that they got specialized in doing some kind of recurrent network or other kind of sort of computation. Mm -hmm. And they can be recruited in many things. That's right. Now, they could be recruited in one thing, another thing. Is there any sort of direction of these approaches that incorporates the kind of this computational way of thinking about it to find out what is special in this module uh, when it gets confused between different cases or when it can discriminate that is participating right. in various functions versus just in something. Because, you know, dorsal ACC, all these regions, they're very promiscuous. They're not, like, you know, interested in one thing or the That's other. That's right, yeah. But it would be interesting to see what is the sort of the kinds of basic computation they're doing. Any direction of that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. about decoding approaches mm -hmm. is that they miss the computational... Yeah, so it's not, they're not a great, they're, yeah. Right, so I guess I have two um, responses to your question. So first, one way you, of, of, of a future direction you can imagine is like, well, what if we have like a basis set, a, a set of basis um, representations? So we have like a, a cognitive control one, we have a memory one, we have all these different ones. And then for any given um, new task, we can maybe make a linear combination of them to basically predict what they're doing and we might get better and better decoding. So I've played around with that idea and it kind of works. Um, but I, haven't, I think it's like you'd actually have to do some proper experiments to do it well. Um, so that's definitely one approach. And you can also, anyway, so I think that's a really cool approach to go. You could also imagine um, uh, what we're trying to emphasize is like what's, what's specific. Um, so when we, every time we see this, we know that that's what that representation or that's what that function is. But there's some functions that are generic, like old direct attention and the cingulate and the ACC. And is there still a place for it in these models or not? Um, and that's another question. And can we do anything a, a way, a build a model that incorporates that into a more complex like process model? And I've been thinking about ways to do it. I haven't come up with like a great way, but I feel like something in combining like an encoding decoding approach, like like you know what you and many other people do, um, is probably like a, a a great way to go forward on it. Um, yeah, but I haven't made a ton of progress on that yet. Another way that um, we're also pursuing is now that we have representations of certain types of effective states, can we use these as intermediate representations and to test like utility models of, of decision making? So can I tell when you're feeling bad and does that actually inc um, help me in a way to predict your decision? Um, so we, we're exploring that avenue too. All right.